You are listening to a Sunday morning message from River Corner Church. River Corner Church is a growing church community of everyday people who gather to worship God, follow Jesus, and journey through life together. You are invited to gather with us on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. If you have any questions about something you heard in this message, or if you want to learn more about our growing church community, visit us online at rivercornerchurch.com. A few years ago, I was walking downtown with Rip. Many of you have come to know Rip. Rip and I have pastored in a context together. We do a podcast together. He's spoken here a few times. And Rip and I were walking, and we encountered a lady that asked for prayer or needed prayer on the street that had a serious limp going on with her body. In fact, her I believe it was her left leg completely drug as she walked. And... You know, we we began to pray with her and just pray for healing. And it didn't really seem like anything had changed. But there was another lady with us by the name of Carlisle who, as we were kind of just like, well, God's not doing anything. Let's close it down and walk away, said, I just need to ask you, have you ever forgiven your dad? And Rip and I looked at her like, well, Carlisle, do you know this lady? Like, is there some established history here? Uh, you're, you know, you're airing someone's dirty laundry. And, and Carlisle just said, I just see this picture. And she went on to describe what her dad looked like. And, and uh, the lady just broke down crying in a complete tears. And for a few minutes there behind what is now Southern Market, we just processed this sense of unforgiveness that was held up in this lady. Ironically, as she walked away, and her friend had kind of stood off waiting for her to return, uh, as she walked away, her limp had increased, uh, decreased significantly. I mean, it was almost unnoticeable. A leg that was dragging now was walking with step. Science has a lot to say about the effects of unforgiveness in her body. In fact, they say unforgiveness has the ability to increase cancer in our body. It has the the ability to create other health problems, other autoimmune disease, or at least worsen them. There's uh, a great report on this uh, right now on the Mayo Clinic website on the effects of unforgiveness. And really, I think most of us at some level like to think we're really good at forgiveness, but Forgiveness is really hard. And I'm not just talking about forgiving people that have wronged you in some way, because that's hard, but also forgiving yourself. Sometimes we hold ourselves captive more than anything else. In fact, I think too often, instead of choosing forgiveness or to dress ourselves up in the clothing of forgiveness, we choose to dress ourselves up in shame. Those of us that work at Water Street often run into people who have experienced deep shame. And I think most of us accept shame over forgiveness time and time again. But forgiveness is a matter of just asking. A few years ago, I was on this work trip where we were supposed to learn to play together nicely. You guys ever, when you worked or did work or are working, did your company ever make you do team building exercises? Stupidest things in the world. Can any, anybody, does anyone in a room like team building exercise? Two people in the room. Okay. Well, I don't like being forced to survive on some island of hot lava with other people that, uh, can't think straight. And so uh, there was this game we played where they put us blindfolded on a rope in a circle, but we didn't know it was a circle. They led us into this maze and they said, you need to follow the rope and find your way out. Do you guys remember this? And uh, from the start, I knew I wasn't going to like it. I mean, we can talk another time about how narratives that we create for ourselves shape the encounter that follows after it. But uh, the Guide kept saying, if you need help, just raise your hand. He's probably said it like 10 times. If you just need help, raise your hand. 
And what we didn't know, or at least I didn't know at the time, is if you had just slipped your hand up, the guy came over, took your blindfold off, took you off the rope, and you were done. The idea was to teach you to call out for help or that help and dependence were okay. But some people obviously stayed on the rope for a really, really long time. And I think that's what happens a lot of times with our sense of shame and unforgiveness. We either hold on to the rope of unforgiveness with others or with ourselves or even with God. And we just stay on this rope and this loop and we keep trying harder and harder to get off it. When really forgiveness comes just when we ask for help, when we raise our hand up and ask for help. Over the past few weeks, we've been looking at a series on the Lord's Prayer. And as I've continued to say over the past few weeks, most of us maintain some sort of dedicated discipline and practice of prayer. And we integrate it into our daily lives. And in our practice of prayer, we certainly get those moments where we feel peace. But I think Jesus gives us the Lord's Prayer, a prayer that should do more than, we'll see there. Pull it out of my pocket, see if that helps. The Lord's Prayer is meant to be a, a prayer that we experience. So this morning we're continuing the rhythm of prayer, this series that explores what it means to have an effective discipline of prayer. And through the Lord's Prayer, Jesus gifted us this prayer, this practice of prayer that is important to our spiritual formation. In this prayer, Jesus teaches us the secret of his relationship with God the Father, the the secret to his authority and his power was prayer. It was this relationship with God through prayer. And through the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches us how to have that same intentional and intimate, committed relationship with God the Father as Jesus did. And through the rhythm of this essential prayer, uh, we are reminded and renewed that God the Father's character shows up, his kingdom, his provision, his forgiveness, his guidance, and his protection. And so each week we've been looking at one new line of the Lord's Prayer and looking at what it can teach us about the Spirit-filled life and about maintaining a prayer relationship with the Lord. The hope is that we'll cultivate new insights into a greater sense of intentionality and intimacy and illumination in our prayer experience. This morning, we're going to be continuing our series by looking at Matthew 6, 9 through 15. As I read from Matthew 6, 9 through 15, I invite you to follow along with me. I'm going to be reading out of the New International Version. And as you follow along, I invite you to look at the passage with fresh eyes. And even though we looked at this passage last week, I invite you to still try and allow this story to captivate you in new ways. Let it speak new to you. Matthew 6, 9 through 15 reads like this. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins. You know, over the past few weeks, we've looked at Jesus' teaching, both in the Lord's Prayer, both in Luke and in Matthew. And we've looked at the verses before them. Today we're going to spend some time with the verses after them. But we looked at how also the early church practiced this. We looked at a document called the Didache, which was written between 55 and 100 AD. It's this early teaching of the apostles. And we looked at how Jesus wasn't really introducing something new, but he was taking from many of the prayers of their day, some of the best prayers of the day, and teaching his disciples how to have effective prayers prayers, or what prayer should really be about. In exploring the Lord's Prayer, it became evidence at first we looked at God's character, that the prayer emphasizes authenticity and intimacy with God, and it's not meant to be this religious duty or obligation, but there's a sense of relationship. We found that first we're looking at God's character, then we're looking at God's kingdom, and then we looked at God's provision or the way that we become dependent on him. This morning, we're going to be focusing on one line in the Lord's Prayer, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. It's this line in the Lord's Prayer where we move to talk about God's 
forgiveness. And it's this line about God's forgiveness that appears here after Jesus teaches us to focus on God's character and God's kingdom and God's provision. And it's this line about the forgiveness of debts. It, Jesus is teaching us to reflect in our prayers of our own forgiveness, that we've had to raise our hand and say, hey, I need help, that we dress ourselves in forgiveness, not shame. But we also are to be driven, we're reminded in prayer, to the forgiveness of others, those that have hurt us and harmed us, that have taken from us in some way. And Jesus gives us this line in a prayer that reminds us to make sure there is no hate that's harbored in us, or on forgiveness that lives in us, or any sense that someone owes us in some way. Now, the word for debt in, the main, in, the, in this Lord's Prayer is chosen for great intentionality. It's a word in the Greek which is ophelama, and that speaks to the result of having an obligation or a consequence for incurring a debt. It's this level of offense with another person or a sin or a significant amount of money owed because you have wronged somebody in some way. And the word debt can be used when you're talking about your obligation towards somebody or the obligation they have to you or your obligation to God. In fact, theologian Craig Keener points out at this time, Jewish teaching regarded sins as debts before God. And the same Aramaic word would have implied both. Jesus would have used, by the way, the Aramaic word. It was the spoken language of the day. He did not speak Greek. The disciples wrote in, and the early church wrote in Greek. But the spoken language of the day would have been Aramaic. And Jesus used a word in Aramaic for debt that speaks to the way that our lives can affect others or others can affect us. And it can create a sin or an obligation to each other. The word for debtor in this passage then just speaks to one who owes or is indebted to us. The Aramaic understanding of this, by the way, is just simply it's a sinner. It's somebody who owes you in some way. A debtor is someone who is under obligation to pay back a debt that they've incurred or they in some way need to make right a wrong that they have done to you. Now, let me just pause here for a minute and I say, as we talk about forgiveness, I'm not making an excuse that people do not need to make right their wrongs. If we've wronged somebody in some way, there's an important action that should follow that. Prayer precedes action. Right? We should walk out reconciliation, restoration. And if someone has wronged us in some way, they too should make that right. That there is a, a certain level of honesty that needs to happen and authenticity, transparency, that they can admit to the wrong and walk out a healing, restorative, uh, reconciling uh, action towards us. But today, when we talk about this line in the Lord's Prayer, we're talking about what it means when we allow such things to live inside us. Now, depending on how you grew up, you might have learned the Lord's Prayer in one of three ways. You might have learned it, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. By the way, anyone, this is my favorite version to say. Anyone else in here with me that? I love the line, trespasses. Right? Or you may have learned it as this way, and forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. That's what we said this morning. Or perhaps you've said, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Truthfully, all of these ideas, debts, trespasses, and sins are captured in this core idea of debt that Jesus would have used. All of them are past tense, by the way, notice. There's this sense that there's this past tense, that you've dealt with them before going into prayer. You're dealing with your anger and your unforgiveness the way that you have accepted shame before you're going into prayer. We, in prayer, are reminding ourselves that we are forgiven no matter what debt, no sin or trespass that we've committed or have incurred, and we make that right. One of the ways that we walk out our forgiveness is by liberating others from a sense of prison that we've created for them out of their obligation or the anger that we've harbored 
the scriptures have a rhythm to forgiveness that's found in the first and Old Testament. Just as the seventh day was a day of rest, the seventh year was a year of rest. In the seventh year, the land was given rest. The poor were allowed to collect from the field. Wild animals were given rest to scavenge the fields. By the way, this is so the land and nature could heal. In COVID, there was a great documentary that came out. For a year and a half, the world was shut down. And you may remember there was news of the ozone hole repairing itself. There were stories in uh, Middle Eastern countries where, like, Lions and tigers were returning into cities because the people weren't there. And for a year and a half, the environment actually began to heal itself. Some of the smog that sat above our own city uh, had dissipated. The land is meant to heal itself when it's given rest. In this day, there was a blast of horn, which is what a jubilee is, that was declared on the seventh cycle of those seven years. So every seven years you had a mini jubilee, but then on the seventh cycle of the seven years, that's 49 years, they would blow a really big jubilee trumpet, and the following year was the 50th year. And that was a time of great celebration. People were released from every obligation they had, every bondage they had, every debts they had. Right, so if you were somebody who owed somebody, and so you worked on their farm to pay it off, even if your money wasn't paid off, you were forgiven. Now, that's really good for the guy that might still have 50 years left on his contract, but it might also feel unfair to the guy that only incurred debt at 48 years, right? But that's Jesus' parable later on about the workers who get paid equally. In this time, everything was to be wiped. People and animals were to be able to experience true rest for a whole year. However, by the time of Jesus, as we as humans do, scholars found ways to circumvent the release of debts. They would not charge interest, or they would break interest off for that year. They, they would still find ways that creditors continue to lend and obligate people in some way. Just note, before we judge them, you and I justify a lot of reasons to remember our sins or the sins of those that have trespassed us in some way. Yeah, but this, this one is, right? When we're coming into prayer, those things that are still living in us, that are still driving such an emotional impulse, are supposed to be squashed. However, we might also see that the year of Jubilee is caught up in this sense of the Lord's Prayer. But not just a financial freedom, spiritual freedom. Not just with each other, but with God. Through this prayer, Jesus is reminding us, though, that the forgiveness of debts is not just going to happen, that's going to happen every seven or 50 years, but something that we are going to practice with each other and with ourselves daily. Again, a couple weeks ago, we looked at this document called the Didache. And we saw that the early church read the Lord's Prayer how many times? Three times a day, right? Three times. And so the early church practiced praying this discipline of the Lord's Prayer, this sense of asking for God's forgiveness, three times a day. Three times a day they were practicing the year of Jubilee. They were practicing what it meant to accept God's forgiveness and to let others go of obligation and debt. The Lord's Prayer, this line in the Lord's Prayer, is meant to remind us of God's forgiveness and to forgive others in the same way, which is essential to effective prayers, but also to living a spirit-filled life. When you hear this idea of debt forgiveness, another story may come to your mind. A couple chapters later from this one, in Matthew 18, Peter is talking with Jesus, and he says, Jesus, i got some really bad people in my life. You know, they're, they're cutting me down all the time. I mean, how many times am I supposed to forgive them? And then Peter says, I mean, like seven times, right? Because the whole year of Jubilee thing, right? He's playing on some number in his head based on the year of Jubilee. And Jesus answers with a number that recognizes ongoing forgiveness. And then according to Matthew, Jesus goes into telling a parable about a king. A king who has a man who owes him money, more money than he can ever pay back. And the man is brought before the king. The man pleads, and the king does what? He forgives him. You know what? I understand. Life is hard. Been there, done that. Uh, 
let's settle on your debt, as all good creditors do, and sends him out, right? Then that man goes home and realizes that someone who owes him just a little bit of obligation hasn't paid up. And he's ready to take the man's life over it. This man who has had a lot forgiven is now going after the man that's only done a little thing. We do this all the time. And the king hears about it. It gets back to him. And he brings the man before him. And he says, whoa, whoa, whoa. We settled up. I took it off your credit report. But then you went and you did that? He says, guess what? Now I'm going to put you in jail. And I'm going to torture you until every penny is paid back. Then Jesus says something, something that I don't think we spend enough time focusing on. I also think it can teach us a lot about hell, the purpose of hell, and also just the purpose of redemption. But Jesus says this, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The king in the story, obviously, is Jesus. Jesus reveals a lot in this parable about God the father, about the kingdom, but He's echoing this idea of forgiveness that shows up in all of his teachings, and he begins to talk about how we're to be a people of forgiveness, to live a life of forgiveness, to love those who hate us, to bless those who curse us, to pray for those who make themselves our enemies, to turn our cheek to those that harm them. And that's what Jesus is getting at in this line of prayer. And by the way, I would think, I haven't counted up the verses, but I would make you guess that Jesus talks more individual times at least, about forgiveness and the effects of one forgiveness than he ever talks about heaven. In this line of the Lord's Prayer, we remember and we reflect that we enact and live out God's command to live as prisoners to no sin and imprison no one for their wrongdoings. As someone who has been harmed, I'm talking for myself, as someone who has been harmed by people and injured by the wrongful acts of others, This line hurts. I don't want to forgive. Because I want them to feel the way that I feel. You guys ever say that inside yourself? There are two people in life. There are people that, my wife is one of these people, they can just shake off wrongs. Like, oh, it's no big deal. No, no. If you hurt me, I'm going to put your face in the mud so you never hurt me again. And I'm going to just push it a little farther so you know you can never do it to me again. Right? That's the other kind of people in the world. But this line, it challenges us. The Lord's Prayer, this line of the Lord's Prayer is a reminder of everything that Jesus taught. It realigns us to the ways, the words, the works of Jesus. In this line of the Lord's Prayer, we remember the heart and the intent of God and his teachings through Jesus. Jesus tells his audience in Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, whenever you stand praying, that's how they prayed in his day, Forgive, right? So whenever you stand to pray, when you're getting ready to pray, first step, act of forgiveness. And if you have anything against anyone, so that your father, also, your father also who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. John, an early follower of Jesus in his later years, in 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. So we see that there's this dependency on our ability to forgive others and call on God at the core of what it means to be forgiven. In Luke 6, 37, Jesus then says, forgive and you will be forgiven. Now, at the end of the Lord's Prayer section that we read today, Jesus, or at least Matthew, tasked on another part. I'm not sure if this line really followed Jesus' teaching or if Matthew just saw them as associated and put it there. Scholars can debate those things. But it's essential for us to understand that this is commentary on this line of the Lord's Prayer. Jesus says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Do we ever really stop and think about that line? We stop with, God will forgive us. Father will also forgive you. But in this line that follows up to the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is teaching something really important. Forgiveness is a two-way street. Like in the parable, Jesus is emphasizing that if we expect to have forgiveness from God for our own mistakes and wrongdoings, then we also must be willing to extend forgiveness to those that have wronged us. 
Now hear me. This is my thoughts. The more we embrace God's forgiveness, the more we forgive others. The more we embrace God's forgiveness, the more we will forgive others. At the same time, the more we forgive others, the more we will experience God's forgiveness. The more we learn to forgive others, the more we will experience God's forgiveness. The spirit-filled life is about learning this interconnectedness of forgiveness in our interactions with others. The idea of liberating us from the power of our sins, the idea of liberating us from the the prison that sin makes for us in a way that unforgiveness of ourselves or others is exactly why Jesus came. It's why Jesus came, because he stands up at the beginning of his ministry, right as he's getting ready to start, Luke says, and he says, the Spirit, so Spirit-filled life, right? This is what it is. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he's anointed me, he's chosen me, he's, he's anointed me with oil for this purpose to proclaim good news. And what is some of that good news? To proclaim freedom. The word there is actually liberation for the prisoners. And to set the oppressed free. Not just acts of justice of setting prisoners free, which this is part of that. But it's also speaking of the way that we've imprisoned each other. At this time, people were deeply imprisoned, not only by their financial debts because of the hard times, but the way that they had become cold and hardened of hearts for each other. I think sometimes the easier life is, the more hard our hearts get. I have no science behind that. But I suspect in today's time, one of the weaknesses, the things that we see the most in this freedom that we have, is that we get more polarized and hardened hearts against each other. In understanding the significance of the word debts in the Lord's Prayer, we encounter the truth about forgiveness and obligation. Jesus calls us to pray and be aware of the interconnectedness of relationships with others and with God. They're one and the same. Just as we see forgiveness from our Heavenly Father, we're called to extend that same forgiveness to those that have wronged us. This reciprocity forms the foundation of a spirit-filled life. And where there's liberating power of forgiveness, it not only sets us free, where we're not only liberated, but it flows through us. What we experience vertically gets poured out horizontally. Jesus invites us into this daily practice of forgiveness, of praying the Lord's Prayer that reminds us to embrace God's forgiveness. You know, we're in a society that loves affirmation statements. I'm strong, I'm, I'm cool, right, whatever. You know, one of my favorite uh, examples of this, have you guys ever seen the movie Cool Runnings? Yeah, it's one of my favorite movies, right? About the Jamaican bobsled team. And there's this guy in there, Junior, that has no, no security of himself. He's the most insecure guy. And he practices looking in the mirror and talking about himself I'm strong, right? I'm not going to be pushed around, you know? And, you know, then he runs into his dad. He's like, hey, dad, hey, uh, right? But eventually he discovers his self. If you need those kind of affirmations, then this aspect of the Lord's Prayer might be good for you to say, I am forgiven. I am forgiven. Sometimes I practice the Lord's Prayer in that way. I'm claiming it rather than just praying about it, right? You are my father. You are in heaven, but you are also Close. Your kingdom is holy and great and set apart, but it is coming here, and I see it at work. See, you can move it into ways of owning it for yourself. And then this line, I am forgiven, helping you address yourself in that forgiveness rather than shame. In building a discipling culture, author Mike Breen says this line, and please just listen to this because I think it's an amazing little section. He says, God gives us each a territory that's ours. And his provision within that territory is full and without want. Yet for some reason, we like to stray from our land and try to take what is not ours. We trespass into our neighbor's land and we incur a debt we cannot pay. And when we trespass against another, we are saying, God, what you've given me in my territory is not enough. You and I do that all the time. I think one of the things that God will ask us about the most is our effect on others. Not so much our individual sins, but the way that our sins have affected others. We must make right with those that we have wronged, and we must make our wrongs right. However, 
we can't plateau and just accept shame. We also need to accept God's forgiveness. In this passage, Breen goes on then to point out, he says, we're not only asking God to guide us in our steps, but we're also saying, Lord, forgive those who stray from their path onto ours, who hurt us and abuse us and cause us pain. And then we need to forgive them as God has forgiven us. That too is an action. It's this uh, act that we do before we pray. Conversation for another time, but forgiveness is a deep topic. For now, I want us to see, though, that in entering prayers, forgiveness is essential. Sometimes I use the Lord's Prayer as a diagnostic of myself. I say the Lord's Prayer a few times, kind of get myself calmed down, and then I'll pray it line by line, and I'll picture that line. And I use it because if there's a line that I get to and I can't picture it anymore or say it, like if I get to this line and say, Lord, just help me forgive others. And then I see an image of somebody that's not God doing something forgiving, but it's somebody I'm angry at. I realize that maybe the reason God is feeling so far away from me or distant or quiet is because the thing between me and God is this sense of unforgiveness. There's five quick things I want to say about this passage. Our prayers experience greater effectiveness when we accept and extend forgiveness. Right? They're more effective the more we do it. So two, we should intentionally invite God's forgiveness into our lives and into the places that we feel hurt. There's a story of, um, my brain just went like this. Uh, She helped people that were in the concentration camps. She went into concentration Corrie ten Boom. There's a point later in her life, she's, I believe, in her late 70s, that she runs into one of the uh, Nazi camp leaders who not only brutally raped and tortured her sister, but hurt her as well. And he walks up and says, hey, I'm a Christian. I've been forgiven now. And she said, the sarcasm, the, the narcissism, you know, she did not want to accept this in any way. And he says, but I would really like to get forgiveness from somebody that I've wronged. Can you do that? Can you forgive me? And she said she sat there for a minute, and this was her answer. No, I can't forgive you. Right? That's beyond, I mean, that's, that's another level, right? But she goes, but I know God can and will eventually through me, right? She's basically saying and modeling something for us that I want us to catch. Sometimes we may not be able to extend forgiveness on our own power, but we have to say, God, help me forgive that person, right? She lived something deep and was able to learn forgiveness. Um, Three, the more we reflect on God's forgiveness in our own lives, the more intimately we'll be able to forgive others. For we pray for God's forgiveness because it's meant to be experienced in our lives. God's forgiveness is not just this intellectual ascent where we say, yep, said it, done it once, or yep, every time I slip up, I've said it. But it's this sense of re-identity that we're supposed to experience. And lastly, the more we focus on God's forgiveness in our prayers, right, the more it becomes a focal point in our prayers, the more it's actually going to renovate and, and be present in our hearts, it's going to renovate our hearts and minds, renovating our outlook, our choices, and our actions towards others. In his book, Mike Breen says, at this point of the Lord's Prayer, we're saying, keep us, Lord, from being indebted to you in withholding forgiveness from others. It's this line that asks us, and ask the Father's guidance to prevent us from accumulating a spiritual debt by refusing to forgive others, recognizing the holding on to grudges can hinder our relationship with God the Father and with others. It's important for the effectiveness of our prayers that we remember we've been forgiven and that we're not to imprison ourselves or others. In response to the challenge of ongoing prayer that we've been in, This week, as you pray the Lord's Prayer, as you utilize these aspects of the Lord's Prayer, I hope you will incorporate deeper reflection on God's forgiveness in your life and that you'll reflect to the places in which you still need to forgive yourself and others, to call on God's help in doing it. In prayer, we remember that God is near to us, that God cares, that God is forgiving. We're putting our hand up and saying, help me, I'm on the rope. 
And we're also reminded that God wants to, us to experience his forgiveness. He wants to come and get us off the rope to be with him. The freedom of forgiveness with others. That's what makes effective prayers. So thank you for continuing to journey with me through this series. May God's forgiveness become more central in your times of prayer. And that's my hope for my prayer time as well. Now next week we're going to examine how God's guidance is an important aspect of the Lord's Prayer. And if you have missed or, or uh, want to relive or re-listen to one of the messages, you can always find them on our website or wherever podcasts are found.